Well, good evening and welcome to um, our Bond 2021 information program tonight. I'm Dr. Jeannie Stone and I'm the superintendent here in Richardson ISD and I want to welcome everyone. At this time I want to introduce you to Teresa Ordonez who's going to give some instructions about translation. Thank you Dr. Stone. Buenas tardes a todos. Al terminar de dar instrucciones, eh, estas instrucciones van a poder ver en la parte de abajo de la pantalla en el menú Aparece un mundito que dice interpretación, presione ahí y le dará la opción de inglés o español. Para escuchar la versión en español, presione español y después le pide apagar el audio original. Gracias por acompañarnos. Mayra Durán y Teresa Ordóñez estarán proporcionando la interpretación en español. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ms. Ordonez. And um, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to one of our um, school board members. Ms. Karen Clardy is here. She is our school board president. And I'll let her say, uh, give you a welcome as well. Good evening and welcome all of you to our last public forum um, on Zoom. We appreciate uh, you coming in and asking, I uh, hope you ask lots of questions because when you ask lots of questions, that's a good thing. You can go to the polls as an informed voter. Um, in my 30 years of being connected with RISD, I believe this is probably the best bond I've ever seen uh, brought forth to the community. It has been planned for five years. We've involved the community. We've had facility studies. We've had demographic studies. And um, there's no bells or whistles on this bond. It's uh, strictly needs-based. So I, I'm, we've got some great presenters tonight. And I welcome all of you. And thank you for uh, coming in and visiting and, and being here with us tonight. Thank you. We also have a few other of our Richardson ISD staff who are serving uh, in the role of answering any questions that you might have tonight. And so I'll ask them if they would, one at a time, just introduce themselves and give a welcome. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Hello, I'm Tabitha Branham and I am honored to serve as your deputy superintendent. Good evening, I'm Sandra Hayes. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Operations. Good evening, I'm David Pate, the Chief Financial Officer. Well, thank you very much. And thank you again to all of you who are here tonight. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, an icon that says Q&A. That is the place that we will be monitoring your questions. So if you have any questions as they come up, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. We're not gonna use the chat, we're gonna stick with the Q&A and uh, we'll be monitoring that and be prepared at the end of our presentation to answer all of your questions. So um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant Superintendent for District Operations, Sandra Hayes, and she's going to cover some slides with you and then we're gonna get plenty of time for Q&A. But use the Q&A as we're going through the presentation so we'll be ready whenever you are. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to share information regarding our Bond 2021 campaign. And Brian, my screen is not moving. Here we go. Okay, on February 8th, our Board of Trustees called for two bond propositions to be placed on the May 1st ballot. Proposition A for $694 million and Proposition B for $56 million. This is the results of a two-year planning process that we start. Um, it is based on recommendations from our Community Bond Steering Committee. And again, the total for May 1st ballots are $750 million. Our Bond Steering Committee was made up of 50 folks from across the district. It represented parents, business owners, senior citizens, community leaders um, and those who graduated from RSD and returned to their community to raise their own families. The committee began meeting in the fall of 2020 and concluded its work with a recommendation to our board of trustees in January of 2021. Before the bond steering committee um, became uh, really started, the board of trustees created a charge and parameters for this committee. 
This was going to be a working committee that had a lot of data analysis to do. It needed to consider all the needs of our students across the district. It needed to make sure it had input from the community. Uh, it was fiscally sound and it had recommendations that addressed the growth and the facility needs that our district is experiencing at this time. These are the areas of focus that our committee was asked to look at. Um, first and foremost for bonds is the facilities. Uh, our facilities are in critical needs um, due to the age of the, our facilities and the conditions. Um, we have a middle school transformation that came from a strategic plan. Uh, we are continuing to see growth in our district, so we need to accommodate that growth. Our student and instructional needs first and foremost, and then through a lens of equity as they did their research and studies. This is the visual that we followed as a bond steering committee. On the left were all the inputs that the committee looked at and studied. Um, we looked at our prior bonds. RISD has a financial model that includes a bond referendum every five years. So they looked at all the past bonds for the district and the cycles that were put in those bonds. They looked at our strategic plan that we did back in 2017-18. The facilities audit that we had from the steering, uh, strategic planning action team um, we looked at all those audits and the condition of our campuses. We studied a capacity study that the district had done, a demographer's report that we have each year. Um, for our areas where we knew we had growth, um, we committed to uh, program planning committees to help talk about the needs on those campuses. We asked all the different departments in the district what their needs were. The steering committee looked at our board goals. And then also we did a community survey in November to ask our community about calling a bond referendum. In the middle of this visual, you'll see in blue around the top and bottom, student learning experience. Those are the driving, uh, that's a driving force or lens for this committee, always keeping our students first and foremost in our minds. Um, the bond steering committee then did a recommendation for our board. They took that recommendation to our board of trustees in January. The board called the election and now it's up for community vote. Proposition A, the $694 million has three major buckets of money, infrastructure and safety for $286 million, construction and renovation for $269 million, and teaching and student support for $139 million. Most important pieces of this particular slide at the bottom, every campus will be impacted with this bond proposal. So every campus and every student benefits from funding from bond 2021. First bucket, infrastructure and safety. These are upgrades to our camera systems across the district, putting a vape detection system in our secondary restrooms, making sure our AED and health services have adequate equipment and are up to date. And the things that you don't see but are imperative to our campuses due to their age is um, improvement of roofing, HVAC, floor repair and replacement. Three years ago, we bought transportation in-house, and so we need to put our bus fleet into a cycle so that we can maintain a bus fleet that is 10 years old or younger. And then we have cycles for our maintenance and security vehicles as well. Also part of this bucket of the $286 million would be furniture for cafeterias, classrooms, and equipment that is bondable. The second buddy, uh, bucket of money is our construction and renovations at $269 million. This is the beginning of a 10 year middle school transformation plan that the district has in place that came out of our strategic plan. We're going to rebuild Lake Highlands Junior High due to the facility condition index. That school has a number of systems that are at end of life and failing and the cost to try to replace those systems and maintain Lake Highlands Junior High would be more than building a new school. So we're gonna build a new Lake Highlands Middle School. We're gonna renovate Forest Meadow to make it Forest Meadow Middle School. That'll be the beginning of our transformation. We're going to add classrooms on to Pierce, Mohawk and Brentfield. Pierce High School is the last of our four high schools to receive these renovations. Um, typically on their master schedule, they have uh, 27 teachers that float um, during the day without a classroom. So we're going to give Pierce High School additional classrooms, um, create a central cafeteria for the school and update and upgrade some of the deficiencies in their auditorium um, and provide two entrances to the school, one on the southern end and one on the northern end that allows administrators to have office space and for students to be able to enter in designated areas for that campus. 
At Brimfield Elementary, we're gonna add additional classrooms, but for safety, we're going to connect the two buildings that are currently on that site. Brentfield Elementary has two different buildings, one built in the 70s and one built in the 80s. And so we're gonna connect those two buildings, make it one continuous campus. Um, in the middle will be a cafeteria for their students and then additional classroom space um, in the renovation as well. At Hamilton Park, it was built in the 50s. Um, it has a fabulous auditorium that is used daily by the students that are at the Hamilton Park Paysetter Magnet, but that auditorium is not connected to that campus. And so we're going to make that connection for safety as well as upgrade some of their learning environments. Um, at Northridge and Stoltz Road, as part of our 20 year long range plan for our elementary schools, we're going to address the learning environment in those campuses. Learning environments would include things like flooring, paint, lights, windows where necessary, um, just uh, refresh and upgrade those campuses um, to feel um, more uh, modern and more able to accommodate the instructional model that we see now at our campuses. So that's all part of the big bucket. That's the $269 million for renovation and construction. This is a little bit more about that middle school transformation. Uh, it is starting in bond 2021. It is a 10 year plan. So it would be part of a bond referendum should the district decide to move forward with one in 2026. Uh, it will help us to uh, renovate and or rebuild all eight of our current junior high schools. Um, in our plan, four of the schools would be rebuilt, four would be renovated. And by 2030, all of our sixth graders would then be in a middle school around the district that would allow all of our elementary schools to have more capacity to open up universal pre-K across the district. Both of these came out of our strategic planning and had community uh, meetings and groups that helped us to put these plans together. The last part of the Proposition A, $694 million is for our teaching and student support, $139 million. This provides textbooks, um, AP and digital textbooks, library books, networking equipment, uh, enterprise applications that we use across the district, teaching, digital teaching applications. This is where our career and technical education classrooms receive equipment and materials. Our fine arts and athletics have their equipment and uniforms on cycles that come out of bond funding. Uh, for athletics in this bond uh, 2021, we'll also be looking at some turf for our baseball and softball fields to help address maintenance and drainage issues that we have. So that's all part of the $139 million bucket. The second proposition that's on the ballot is for $56 million. This is the first time that RISD has had to split this out. This is by legislation. It's required by law that all school districts across the state of Texas take all of their technology devices and put it in its own separate proposition. So proposition B for $56 million will provide technology devices for our 7,000 staff, our 39,000 plus students, and then specialty classrooms around our schools, um, such as audio video classrooms, animation classrooms, et cetera. So all of that is part of proposition B for the $56 million. Good news for this particular bond in 2021 is that there are no changes to our current tax rate. Based on our current projections from our financial advisors, we do have capacity to carry $750 million at our current tax rate. And you can see here our maintenance and operation tax, our interest and sinking fund tax rate for our total tax rate here in RISD. This is a tax rate comparison showing districts around Richardson. Um, one thing to point out on this slide is that we are one of only three districts in our area that still offer, operates under an optional homestead exemption. And that optional homestead exemption is not being removed. So that stays in place and our tax rate stays the same. This is a tax rate history for RISD. You can see um, the consistency of our tax rates. And um, we went up in 2018 with a TRE and then compressed back down with House Bill 3 and legislation. Uh, this particular slide deck is available to the public out on our website. So any of this that you would like to dig in and look a little closer, you're free to do. Ballot language is our information piece that we wanna share with the community so that everyone understands what they're seeing. 
There is a new state law that requires all school districts that offer up a bond uh, referendum on a ballot, that that ballot language has to include, this is a property tax increase. That statement is there regardless of the circumstances of the district. We wanna make sure that everybody understands for Richardson ISD, we are able to put this bond referendum on the ballot with no tax rate increase. Some examples of what you'll see, this is what Proposition A and Proposition B look like, the language that you'll see on the ballot. And again, that last sentence in all caps, this is a property tax increase, is required to be there by law, it's required to be the last sentence in the ballot language, and it cannot be modified. Under House Bill 3, any bond issuance for any amount, regardless of how it impacts the school district, has that same sentence on the ballot. If a district lowers their tax rate, that same sentence would be there. If a district keeps their tax rate the same as Richardson is doing in this bond, that sentence still has to be there. If you're issuing a bond for a single dollar and it would lower the tax rate, that sentence would still be on the ballot. So we just want all of our voters to be informed and educated and understand that that sentence is there regardless of the impact. And so for RISD, we are able to carry this bond debt with no tax rate increase. We are able to do that thanks to Mr. Pate and his financial team. Um, we are a very conservative district. We aggressively pay back our debts. We do a lot of refunding on our bonds to get the lowest interest rates possible. We uh, continue to see growth in property values, so we uh, carefully monitor those. And we maintain our high ratings with Moody's and Standard & Poor's. Election day is May 1st. Early voting started Monday, April, 20, April 19th and goes through April 27th. This is a website that you can visit to see this slide. There's a video there that you can watch that takes you through bond 2016 and bond 2021. And at this time, we're going to open it up and answer the questions out of the Q&A. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. We do have a few questions that are in the Q&A. The first one, there appears to be some confusion publicly because of the new law requirements for voting verbiage. This is basically a request for approval to secure a bond or debt for the presented spending needs. This is not supported by a tax increase, correct? This will be supported by existing taxes as they are. It is just a request for approval to spend funds as presented. Uh, thank you, Tabitha. So um, the, make sure I address this. So yes, the start of the, the first part, this is basically a request for approval to secure bonded debt for the presented needs. Yes, that is correct. We cannot sell uh, bonds without voter approval. Um, and then the next part, this is not supported by a tax increase. So this is not supported by a tax rate increase. Whether or not an individual property taxpayer's uh, tax bill rises or falls all depends on whether or not the appraisal district uh, changes their property value. I can say that the um, model that we used in developing this particular bond and the $750 million capacity is based on two and a half percent property value growth for this year uh, and 1% property value growth for every year thereafter. And historically over the last 25 years, the district's property value has grown at an average of 3.7% annually. Thank you, Mr. Pate. The next question is one actually I will take. Um, does the technology bond include funds for Wi-Fi hotspots for students who need it? Um, and in the bond 2021, there is not an allocated I, uh, line item for hotspots um, as a result of investment that we have made during the uh, COVID pandemic. We have an ample supply of available hotspots um, as well as the ability to um, have data enabled. So at that time, this was not seen as a demand. In addition, we are a part of the state's efforts for operation connectivity and are working on some um, long-term connectivity issues with some of our local providers. 
um, so that at some point we hope that our hotspots won't even be needed. Uh, the next question um, is, a, it looks like this really isn't a clarification, it's just more of a um, statement, but Mr. Pate, you may just want to reiterate what you just shared. This is a property tax increase. New schools means home values go up, which means we pay more. The sentence is accurate. So if a property taxpayer's uh, home or other taxable property increases uh, with the and the tax rate remains the same, then yes, their tax bill will go up. But RISD is able to service this $750 million in debt at the existing 35 cent tax rate. Thank you, Mr. Pate. What is RISD doing about ensuring that our financial investments, that is the funding these types of bonds that are designed and intended for the improvement of infrastructures of brick and mortar edifices in schools, computers, networks, buses, et cetera, that are in the end intended to better educate our RISD kids and prepare them for their futures. With all of our financial commitment, what is being done by RISD to guarantee that our RISD kids are guaranteed jobs upon their graduation? Dr. Shannon, I don't know if you want to take that or if you want me to address from in terms of our college preparation and career preparation. Okay, um, th I think this is a great question because ultimately that is really what we are about. It's ensuring that we do have the infrastructure in place, the learning environment, the tools, the resources that we can put in the hands of our, our teachers and our students to ensure that they are college and career and or military ready. Um, and we have worked thanks to this, the leadership of Dr. Stone and our board of trustees over the course of the last five years to build a really set robust uh, set of pathways at all four of our high schools where students really beginning in seventh or eighth grade are beginning to take um, career and technology education courses um, that can lead them to high demand, high wage jobs. Um, we implemented at two of our high schools what we call our P-TECH programs. And these are actually opportunities where our students are entering high school and they're entering college at the same time as freshmen. And in the end, they're going to have an opportunity to graduate high school with an associate's degree along with industry certifications where they can move on and either go to a four-year university or immediately go into the workforce and be career ready. Um, we are absolutely committed to ensuring every student has the experiences that they need, that they can identify what it is they hope to accomplish um, and that we provide them a breadth of courses and a breadth of experiences that are gonna prepare them. Whether it's um, they want to go to a four year um, Ivy League college through AP and um, on ramps and dual credit, or they know they want to enter the, the, the career um, in the workforce and we prepare them with those necessary certifications. We actually have a board goal um, that is directly related to this. And we actually shared information on Monday night. If you wanna go watch that board meeting, um, the amazing growth that we've had in the area of CCMR and alone from um, 2018 to 2019, we saw a 7% increase in the number of our students uh, moving from 69% to 76% of our students who are meeting um, that indicator as defined by the state. So we still have work to do, but we're very proud of the progress. And Dr. Stone, I don't know if you'd like to add anything else. Okay, next question. Um, what is the reason for the government required standard language? It seems to cause unnecessary confusion. And <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Tabitha. The um... Rationale behind the language is that if the bonds, if any bonds were not approved by voters, then ultimately tax rates would go down at some point. RISD has, um, our existing outstanding debt uh, matures in 2044. So, you know, for, we still have to make debt payments until then. So the tax rate in RISD would not immediately decline if this bond and future bonds were not approved. But the logic again was if the bonds didn't exist, uh, the tax rates for entities would eventually go down. Thank you, Mr. Pate. What is the point of educating our children if their education is instead ignored by corporations where RISD graduates are supplanted by imported foreign nationals because corporations claim our American resources are lacking in the education 
qualifications and skill sets that they require to remain competitive in global economies. I can, yeah, I think I can say that we, um, uh, we are hearing um, a little bit of a, of a different narrative from our local business partners um, in that they are, um, they are working with us. They are partnering with us. They are sitting at the table with our teachers, with our curriculum writers, and identifying what are those skill sets that we need to ensure our students leave with in order to be successful. So I'll give you an example. Um, recently at our healthcare academy, we had a um, local medical facility come and say, one of the things that we know are lacking um, is a certain area of pharmacy tech. And we're not producing enough graduates um, that have that skill set. And if they earn that certification um, and come and work in our workplace, um, they, they can actually earn a very high wage job, even while they're putting themselves through school. Um, and they sat alongside us to design the course um, that then leads to that student earning that certification. So it's not just our interpretation of what students need to be successful in navigating um, that, that future workforce, but we are hearing from our industry partners. We know that there is real competition between, you know, the world is continuing to grow more flat and um, people are, you know, you can work anywhere almost now. And I think the pandemic has proved that. Um, and so we are committed to ensuring our students, you know, really have the skill sets necessary to be competitive. Um, and they can walk in to any interview and not only have the industry knowledge they need, but also have those soft skills that we know are so important, like, um, you know, having a strong resume, understanding how to interview, how do you communicate um, your, the strengths that you were, you know, bringing to that job. Um, so please know that, that we are um, engaged in an ongoing conversation with our partners to make sure that we are the pipeline that our industry partners go to when seeking out, um, you know, new employees. Um, next question, uh, assuming the $72 million is received from the federal COVID relief package, will, pro the, will the proposition be $56 million bonds still be issued? And yes, we will still be issuing the uh, $56 million in bonds, the various ESSER funds, uh, that the federal government has approved are approved to address learning loss, recovery of missing students, uh, health and safety and additional substitutes and bus drivers. And I don't know, Ms. Branham, if you have uh, any, any other things you would like to add regarding that issue. Sure, absolutely. It, it's important to note that the um, any of the ESSER funds that we potentially would receive, we are limited in the scope of how we can spend those and the time frame is going to be limited. Um, so we know that our technology and the breadth of the technology that we have to replace, it's not just student laptops. Um, but it is our CTE infrastructure, um, it, you know, ensuring that our teachers have the right technology tools that they need. It is our wireless infrastructure. Um, it is the software and tools that we use in order for our laptops um, and everything to do what they need to do in the learning environment. Um, and so the, the ESSER funds um, would not be sustainable ac across the five years that we would need to continue to refresh our technology infrastructure. Um, so Dr. Stone and our board of trustees really have um, identified the priority of addressing student learning loss and how do we provide enough supports where students who may have experienced virtual learning or may have been out of school for any period of time, we can put the right instructional materials, enough teacher support um, so that we can recover those learning gaps. Um, and the other thing I would wanna address there um, is that that 72 million really is speculation right now. We, we don't know what that dollar amount is going to be. Um, there's some estimates out there, but we are still waiting for Texas to withdraw or to, to draw down that money from um, the federal government. So that number is, is very much in, in flux. And Dr. Stoner, if you wanted to speak to that as well. Uh, no, I think you did a great job. We had a very thorough explanation uh, to our board on Monday night regarding the potential ESSER funds. And for those um, who didn't watch that or are unfamiliar, ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. 
and relates to the money that was allocated um, from Congress for the purposes of, at first, there was one that was for um, just responding to um, and being proactive about COVID-19. And then the other two ESSER funds uh, that came out were related to um, not only COVID, but also to the learning loss and looking forward into the future. Um, we talked with our board on Monday night about how we are still waiting. We are one of only um, two states in the country that, are, that that money has not been released to the local school districts. And so um, we're, we're working with um, the hope and the optimism that that money will come soon. Um, so we, we I invite you to go back and watch the school board uh, meeting on Monday night. We, we talked probably for um, an hour and a half about our plans for um, making You're muted. Okay. Sorry. Was I muted the whole time? No, ma'am. Just that last bit. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so, yes. And so I, I was just going to say, I invite you to watch the board meeting because we had a great conversation about how um, we we have a good plan in place. And now we are just waiting for the funds to, to execute. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, the next question we have, if our no student left behind also applies to hire our students first before hiring imported foreign nationals, wouldn't our $750 million be better applied towards funding Texas Workforce Commission such that our unemployed RST graduates are at, um, at least able to receive our money instead of being penniless? And Mr. Payne, I don't know, maybe if you want to address this from the stance of what we can and cannot use bond funds for. So th th thank you, Ms. Branham. Yeah, so bond funds can only be used for capitalizable items and cannot be used to pay salaries uh, for teaching staff. We cannot use that money to fund other governmental agencies. Uh, I would encourage certainly that any businesses uh, re register as vendors on our district website. Uh, we will be um, accepting bids for a variety of projects uh, funded through this bond funds. And uh, if you go to the district's website and the purchasing department uh, page on the website, there's a place to register to receive notification of bids and uh, vendors that register there receive notification of all bids. It is not just bids for bond funded, bond funded items, but for uh, any items that are bid uh, by the district uh, being paid for from any source of funds. So uh, just encourage our uh, local businesses to register and uh, to receive information about any business categories or all business categories for that matter, if they're interested in those. Uh, Ms. Hayes, I think this next one is for you. What population projections were these building expansions based on? They're based on our demographers report from Templeton Demographics that we see we receive every January. Um, it shows us the um, dem what the predictions are for our different areas around the district. And we look at our capacity study and we look at the demographers report and we talk to the campuses and determine which campuses need additional classroom space for their growth. I think the next one might be for you as well. Uh, can you help us understand the school plan specifically for Lake Highlands Junior High when they came out and what input you received from the residents that will most be affected by the new building? Yes, so early on, um, residents were part of a program planning committee that we had on the school campus to help determine the programming needs of the campus. We rely on the architect and our engineers to determine site locations on um, our properties. For this particular school, we needed to be able to build the school and not affect the existing school um, because we don't have anywhere for those students to go. So we can't shut that school down and tear it down and rebuild. Um, so the um, architect and engineering decided the middle of our site was a good flat area to build a new school. Uh, we received input from neighbors about traffic asking to create more queuing space on the site. So we have that as part of our traffic plan. So more cars will be on our site as they're dropping off and picking up um, off of um, Ferndale and Walnut Hill. Um, and then we received information from the neighbors asking to not move the track, to leave the track on the east end of that site. Um, and so um, we continue to hear from neighbors last week at our community meeting 
online, we heard from neighbors about um, making sure that uh, the lights at Ferndale and Walnut Hill um, were appropriately set for uh, turn lanes and for students to cross when necessary. And so we continue to hear from neighbors and we'll continue to work with the neighborhood as we plan for our first new middle school. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Um, Dr. Stone, I think you're up next. Given that the district is unable to meet its guarantees as well as subsequent mediocre, goal, mediocre goals, why money now? Okay, so I'll take that question kind of in the three parts that I think it's kind of spelled out. First of all, I think the guarantees relates to uh, the work that our um, community did when they laid out our strategic plan in which they guaranteed that all third graders would be reading at grade level and they guaranteed and said all because all means all. And um, I think that that was a real um, that, that was a real statement of the commitment and the aspiration to meet the needs and to reach all students. And we, we're working towards every one of our students reading at grade level and all does mean all. And that was the guarantee. The second part of that question is uh, in terms of um, the, I would, I would disagree that the, that the goals or the board goals are mediocre. The, the, the board goals that have been set are very aggressive. Um, if you if you compare us against the state, we are our student performance, although some people uh, try to say otherwise, our student performance is above the state and we are moving in the right direction. And our goals are very aggressive in that if um, they're for the year 2025. And um, if we were to accomplish those goals, which we are making progress in that direction, then we would close the achievement gap, which is something that um, no other district that I've seen in my lifetime has ever done. And so I think they're very aggressive goals to claim that they're made mediocre, uh, mediocre is uh, certainly a poor word choice. Um, and then the third part would be why money now? And I think that um, the, the money now comes from the, the work that our bond steering committee um, did to uh, determine that now was a time when um, that we need to address our aging facilities with um, facilities being 53 years old and many of them, uh, the systems that are in our buildings failing and that can be very, very cost costly. The community decided and our board agreed and unanimously put forth this um, bond because of this was an opportunity for us to aggressively invest in our aging facilities um, to meet the needs of the future. And so this is part of a, as, as Ms. Hayes said, this is part of a long range plan uh, for us that we would bring all of our schools uh, toward an equitable, at an equitable level within the next 20 years, which is certainly something that we have to uh, rotate and do each 20 years. Right now we're finishing up the end of a 20 year, uh, this year we're, finishing up a, an, the end of a 20 year plan that was written 20 years ago. And so now it's time for us to start looking forward to how we will uh, cycle through and achieving equity at all of our campuses. And so that's the reason why the money for facilities is, is now and all the things that the bond will pay for are related to capital improvements to our buildings. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, Sandra, I think you're up next. Ms. Hayes, my concerns are in regards to the new middle school construction. My home is on Chesterton Drive and the new school would be outside of my backyard. Looking at the drawings I saw yesterday, there would be a loading dock and a dumpster directly outside of my home. In addition, there would be a parking lot lights and a view of a three-story building adversely affecting the quality of life for our homes and in our backyards. Is there not a way to move the school closer to Walnut Hill instead of Chesterton Drive? Yes, thank you. So we will continue to work with our architects and um, the drawings that are currently out on the website are schematic drawings. They're not official construction documents. So we will continue to work. And um, we do have limitations on how close to Walnut Hill we can put a building based on city code. Um, and so we, the architects and our engineers are aware of that. So we will um, continue. We hear from the Chesterton neighbors that there are concerns. Um, the school that is currently built does sit behind Chesterton Drive. Uh, and so this one is sitting right next to it. Um, the three-story part of the building is actually at the front of the school. It is not the back. The back of the school is a two-story, uh, very similar to the existing school that we have on site right now. So yes, we will uh, certainly look to make sure that we don't have uh, dumpsters, 
um, interfering with anyone's backyard. And all the lights that we use on our campuses, um, we use um, moving to LED lights so um, we don't have any light uh, overages off of our properties. We face them down so they do not bother any of our neighbors. Um, we do have many schools around our district of our 55 campuses that are uh, built in neighborhoods around houses. So we are very cognizant of these concerns and we'll continue to work with our neighbors to make sure we are doing the best we can. Ms. Hayes, the next question I think you really address, except for there's one, I think, a uh, new component that you may want to speak to. Um, and it's related to, um, I think, Lake Highlands Junior High and the requesting of speed bumps. Um, for the safety of the children, knowing that there should be, there could be some major increases in traffic. Uh, again, we work with the city of Dallas. Um, those are city public streets. So the city of Dallas is the only one that can put speed bumps in. And um, the city of Dallas requires that neighborhoods pay for those speed bumps. And so that can be um, uh, addressed from the neighborhood HOA. They can reach out to their um, the city and request those and talk about how that funding would happen, but the school district can't put speed bumps on city streets. Uh, there's one more related question I'm seeing next. Um, and I, I, there's actually a couple that I'm gonna kind of pair together um, just while you're addressing this. One is why is it that the loading zone and the mechanical rooms would be on the residential side of the building? I'll let you hit that one first. Yeah, so we're gonna work with our architects. Uh, we'll certainly, if, um, if it's possible to make any adjustments on those to move that mechanical room um, on the side, we can. Um, we have many campuses where our mechanical rooms and loading zones are at the back, our docks where our cafeterias are, but we'll certainly look at that and do what we can to make any adjustments to those drawings. And then I think, Ms. Hayes, if you could just touch on, um, I think there's a question around, it, you know, if the bond should pass and construction begins, what are some of the, um, you know, protective, you know, sound barriers or other things that we would do to help mitigate that noise and the disruption for the neighbors? Right. So all of um, the architects and construction companies that work in RISD around our cities are aware of the requirements for sound barriers and protective barriers, and they follow all of the city codes um, to make sure that residents are uh, not disturbed when at all possible. Um, I can't guarantee that there won't be some noise from construction at times, um, but school is still in session during this, so we also don't want to disrupt our learning environment. So our construction companies and architects are very aware of the K-12 environment and being a, a school and having a school built in a neighborhood. So we will continue to monitor that just as we have at our other construction sites around the district. Um, okay, let's move to this next one. Will the middle school model be rolled out district-wide in 2030 or in attendance zones with like Highlands and Forest Meadow in this bond? Will they transition before the 2030 date? Would you like me to take that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so our 10-year plan for middle school transformation, Lake Highlands Junior High and Forest Meadow are scheduled to begin sixth grade tra uh, transitioning for the 2024 school year. So in 2024, sixth graders around the Lake Highlands learning community would transition into the Lake Highlands Middle School and Forest Meadow Middle School. And then following bond 2026, we would whirl out each of the additional three learning communities um, at the same time so that each, there's two schools in every learning community and we would do two schools at a time so that each learning community would then roll out as they are finished. So by 2030, all the district would be in a sixth grade transition model. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pate, I think this next one is for you. Are RSD bond interest and payment, principal pay, repayments paid for with, um, so are, are paid with any funds other than RSD property tax. So let me repeat that. I'm sorry, it was over to two different Q&As. Are RSD bond interest payments and principal repayments paid for with any other funds other than RSD property tax? Thank you, Ms. Branham. No, there's uh, not capacity in the uh, M&O uh, portion of the districts or the general fund portion of the district's financing and uh, bond repayments are not allowed from federal fund sources. So it is only the uh, interest and in sinking fund tax rate of the district that repays the voter authorized debt. Thank you. Uh, we have another question related to our optional homestead exemption. What exactly is the local optional homestead exempt exemption and why don't most other school districts offer it anymore? 
and I'll take that one, Ms. Branham. The uh, local optional homestead exemption, I honestly do not remember the year it was put in place. We can certainly track that down, but it uh, offers our, our, home, our taxpayers a 10% uh, um, exemption on their residence homestead. So it has to be, it's only on residential properties and it's only on properties that uh, a, a taxpayer has filed a homestead exemption for. And they get not only the $25,000 state mandated homestead exemption, but also an additional 10% of the value of their home uh, as an additional homestead exemption with a minimum of $5,000, uh, which applies to a uh, handful of properties in the district, primarily those properties that are uh, crossing uh, tax, uh, taxable jurisdictions. Um, why, don't other school why don't most other school districts offer it anymore? Uh, that's because um, it does cost a school district money. On the INS tax rate side, that is less revenue uh, that a district collects. Uh, the, um, and on the M&O side, uh, it, all, it reduces the property tax revenue that a district collects and it also reduces uh, by several million dollars the state funding uh, that a school district is entitled to. And uh, as uh, Ms. Hayes said earlier, there are only three districts in uh, Dallas County left and Richardson is one of those that offer a local optional homestead exemption and there are no districts in Collin County offering a local optional homestead exemption. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pate. Um, we have another question related to um, student performance. Uh, during the 2018 TRE debates, Dr. Stone guaranteed that if the TRE passed, all students would perform at or above grade level in all subjects. It is now 2021. Only 47% of third graders read at grade level, 52% for math. Worse, the district goal for two, June 2024 is that 40% of third graders will still read below grade level and 35% of math students. Given that the district is unable to meet its guarantees as well as subsequent mediocre goals, why money now? Yeah, and I'll start with that. And maybe Ms. Branham, you can talk a little bit more in terms of the data. Um, anytime that a word guarantee has been used, as I said earlier, it's um, related to our strategic plan. And specifically, our community members um, wrote out a statement that said, and I'm reading from it right now so I can be exact, we will guarantee that all students will achieve at or above grade level. And again, that was an aspirational statement that was written because it's really a commitment on the fact that we believe that all means all. And our goal is that all students will achieve uh, at grade level. And so, you know, we had over 300 of our community members, parents, staff, and, and even students who worked on our strategic plan. And that was a really important aspirational statement that we would have all of our students achieving at that level. But again, it's definitely aspirational and it's looking out to the future. And that's the reason why our board has set very aggressive board goals. But I think it's also a good thing to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the data that, that has been referenced there and to put it in perspective about how we compare to the state and about how our goals and about how the stars measured. So we can get into that a little bit. Um, although this is about facilities, but since it was um, asked, I think we can go into a little bit. Why don't you, Ms. Branham, go into a little bit just to answer the question about uh, the, the, the data that was, that was dropped in the Q&A? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Stone. One thing that I think it's important to note for anyone watching this is that we actually have not had updated um, STAR data. Um, since the 2018-2019 school year due to the pandemic. So last year, um, we were at this time, last year we were in all at-home learning um, and the state did not um, administer the STAR assessment. Um, so we, this year, um, in an effort to continue to do everything that we can to grow our students regardless of the fact that we've had, you know, throughout the course of the year, as many as 40% of our students learning at home and 60% in the classroom. Um, we implemented MAP assessment, which is the measure of academic progress, so that we could, um, in fact, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, um, really progress monitor our students' growth, specifically in the areas of reading and math. 
Um, it's important to note um, that we are, as a district, um, you know, in the in the top ten districts. I believe, Dr. Stone, we're number four in terms of the diversity of our district across over a thousand districts in the state. We really are a mirror of the state of Texas, and TEA, Texas Education Agency likes to point to Richardson ISD as an example, um, as a proof point, because we do mirror that of the state. And I will tell you that in um, every category, we are currently outperforming the state. Um, and, and this is again going back to 2018-19 data. Um, our students are in the middle of the STAR assessment for the 2020-21 school year, and we will have those results this fall, which will be, allow us to update our Board of Trustees and our community on progress towards that goal. Um, but as Dr. Stone mentioned, um, you know, we have a deep commitment um, that each and every student um, will move from grade level to grade level, reaching those grade level goals. Um, and until we're there, we have, we, you know, we, we are not finished with this goal. Um, but it is um, really um, across the state, our board goals are probably the loftiest goals that exist in terms of not just looking at the number of students who are barely passing the STAR assessment, but that are at that meets level, which is a higher performance level um, than what is expected by the state. Um, so we are making progress. Our map data shows that even in this time um, where we are seeing declines because of the COVID slide, our kids are still growing. Um, and, and I, I think just the only other thing that I would um, add in terms of the why money now um, is that you know, our, our students continue um, to, to demonstrate and our teachers continue to, to demonstrate that there are resources needed um, in order and in the bond there are, while it's heavy, of course, addressing facility needs, um, because of our aging facilities, there are instructional materials, monies, um, everything from uh, science uh, STEM scopes and microscopes to graphing calculators and other learning kits that are essential to help contributing to our goals. And we need to keep those resources refreshed for our teachers and for our students. Uh, next question, is any part of the 2021 bond issue planned as a reissue at current low interest rates of older RSD bonds at higher interest rates? Thank you, Ms. Branham. Uh, so the reissue or refun refunding or refinancing of existing bonds uh, has is a completely separate issue from uh, this bond election. So the bond election is purely for voter approval to issue the $750 million. Once the $750 million or any bonds that voters have approved uh, have been issued, then the district is able to refinance those bonds um, within the rules set out by both the state of Texas and the federal government uh, related to bond refundings. In fact, our most recent bond refunding happened in October of 2020, uh, we there's nothing that makes financial sense at this point to refund. Uh, but I can tell you that over, gosh, since 20 since 2010, the district has received approximately 50 million dollars in savings from refinancing or refunding existing outstanding debt. And uh, we monitor this carefully on an ongoing basis. Uh, with our financial advisors, uh, Hilltop Securities. And so uh, we will, as always, continue to evaluate this and look for opportunities for, to reduce our borrowing costs. Okay, Ms. Hayes, we would like you to meet with the neighbors and not just the architects. Yeah, I believe the next four questions are probably mine. So um, I will take those. Uh, yes, as I shared with both of you earlier today, we are happy to meet with the neighbors. We will be setting that up at um, probably Lake Highlands Junior High, where we can all meet and talk through the plans. Um, so look for that information to come very soon. We will get that meeting set up. We have three schools in our district that are currently three stories. And um, we can have um, invite um, Mrs. Clardy, who is your district representative on our school board to attend the meeting. Should she, um, would she like to do that? I know she's on this call hearing these right now. And then as far as the speed bumps, um, that is a, that's the city of Dallas. They are the ones who have to approve and um, they're the 
ones that you talked to about funding. So RISD cannot put speed bumps on city streets. That's not something um, we'll certainly work with the city um, as we are on that intersection that affects our schools and where traffic is and we will do all of that. Um, and we certainly want all of our students and residents to be safe at all times. So happy to work with the city of Dallas to uh, make sure they hear that um, there are concerns from your street. Um, okay, I believe that next one we've already addressed in, um, I think, in a couple of other questions. So I'm going to hit to our last question that we have here regarding suggestions to improve RSD communications. Could, would RSD do something similar to the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles when motorists renew their vehicle registration? When Dallas CAD property tax RSD school tax notifications are sent out in October, when these taxes are paid, and when the ability to contest tax assessments in the spring, at that time, collect our preferred method of notification, email, text, US mail at those times and send RSD taxpayers latest news. Uh, so I can say that we, the district does, there is, an abil there is the ability for taxpayers to go in and register their preferred communication notification for tax bills. Uh, that tax bills are sent out in a separate system um, and I'm sure we can work with the strategy and engagement department to provide uh, those communication preferences uh, to them. And as far as uh, the, the Dallas Central Appraisal District is a completely separate governmental entity. And so uh, you would have to work with them on uh, how you receive your communications from the Dallas Central Appraisal District. Okay, thank you, Mr. Payton. Dr. Stone, I believe that is all our questions for this evening. Okay, well, I want to wrap up um, and just say again, thank you for attending the meeting. Uh, one of the things that I did see that was um, kind of repeated several times in the Q&A was related to the Lake Highlands Junior High. So um, that's definitely noted. And we want to assure you, as Ms. Sanders uh, Hayes said, that we're going to work with that community uh, because we we hear you and we want to we want to work with you on on this project. So um, I know there'll be some other follow up and some and, and Ms. Hayes, what did you specifically reference related to uh, community involvement? Yeah, we're going to call a meeting for that com for that street. Those are um, the neighbors that um, we hear the concerns from. So we'll certainly set up a meeting at Lake Highlands Junior High for them to attend. And so I'll work with the school to find a date that will work and to send that information out to the neighbors. Okay, good. Well, we wanna make sure that we're, we're really registering those con concerns and questions in particular. So um, again, thank you for being with us tonight. There, um, we are, we do wanna make sure that you know there's lots and lots of information on the website, all kinds of data, uh, facilities audits, everything you can find in terms of reports that people have asked us about, we've posted everything there. Uh, there's a large um, FAQ there that has lots of other questions and answers. And some of the ones tonight, if they're not um, already on the FAQ, then we'll be adding yours to those questions uh, if they're relevant to a bond 2021. So um, thank you. Uh, you can continue to send us any questions um, after this meeting. We're always wanting to make sure everyone is informed. And we just thank you for being here with us and hope that you and your family stay safe and well. And good night.